Café Scientifique is a monthly series of expert-led discussions on science and culture presented by the Bell Museum of Natural History. For more information about the Bell Museum or to find out about upcoming Café Scientifique programs, visit bellmuseum.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Hi folks, how's everybody doing tonight? Nice to see you, thank you. My name is Leah Peterson, I'm from the Bell Museum, as many of you know, and I serve as the adult programs coordinator there. And I just wanna give a shout out to a couple of special guests in the audience tonight, my fiance, Sean, and my soon-to-be stepdaughters, (laughs) Hannah and Lily. (laughs) Thanks, guys. They only get to go out once a year on a Tuesday night, so I wanted to make them special. Make them feel special. (laughs) All right, so uh, uh, without further ado, I want to get to the quiz. Okay, so question number one. Obviously, our topic is crocodiles and alligators tonight. Um, Number one, this is multiple choice, so please wait till you hear all the options before you raise your hand. Do not shout out the answer or you will be disqualified, okay? Everybody got it? Number one. Which of the following differences between alligators and crocodiles is true? So three are false, one is true. A, alligators are endotherms, while crocodiles are ectotherms. B, alligator meat is edible, but crocodile meat contains tetrodotoxin, the same lethal neurotoxin as pufferfish. C, alligators are found in the wild all over the world, while crocodiles are found only in the US and China. Or D, alligators have shorter, wider, more U-shaped heads, while crocodile snouts are longer and more V-shaped. I gotta go with Hannah right there. D, that is correct, well done. (laughs) Good job, Hannah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right, no, no more nepotism, I promise. <laughs> I legitimately, her hand went up at the same time as everybody else's. <laughs> All right, question number two. In a 2013 paper, biologists reported observing tool use in American alligators in the U.S. and mugger crocodiles in India. What were these tools and what they, were they being used for? A, crocs and gators were partially submerging themselves near bird rookeries with sticks balanced across their snouts, baiting herons and egrets collecting sticks for nest building into the perilous snack zone. (laughs) B, crocs and gators were laying eggs in hollow trees underwater, then ripping bark from the tree and chewing it into the shape of a ball to manufacture a plug to plug any of the holes in the hollow tree. C, crocs and gators were breaking off sponges and wearing them over their snouts to protect their nasal passages from debris while foraging for fish burrowing in the substrate. And D, crocs and gators were adorning themselves with found feathers and trash in order to attract their mates. Stanley. A is correct, yes. According to this paper, crocs and gators were observed in these two different places, uh, putting sticks on their noses in bird rookeries and uh, and tempting the birds to come try to collect the sticks, and then that was the end for the birds. (laughs) All right, question number three is a true or false question. The muscles used by crocodiles to open their jaws are so weak they can be held shut by an adhesive bandage or a person using just one hand. True or false? Yes. That is true, correct. Very good, very good. (laughs) All right, just two more questions tonight, okay? All right, number four. Of the 20 to 80 eggs female crocodiles lay in a single clutch, what percentage are likely to hatch successfully and survive the first year of life. And I just wanna say, I got this from one source. There were a few different, you know, interpretations of what that percentage might actually be, but. Okay, A, 99% survival. B, 55%. C, 25%. Or D, 1%. Lily. 
Two, oh, so close, Lily. Good, good call. Back. 1% is correct. Yes. So closer to 1%. Um, some of the estimates were closer to 20, 20%. Um, as many as 99% of hatchlings are eaten by large fish, monitor lizards, and in a twist of, I don't know, ironic justice, herons. So the adults are eating the herons and the herons are eating the babies. It works, works out. And also they're eaten by adult crocodiles. And if you have different stats on that that you, need, that you want to share, please feel free. <laughs> All right, last question for tonight. Crocodiles share a 240 million year old common ancestor with their closest living relatives, the blank. Is their closest living relative A, pythons, B, sea turtles, C, mice, or D, birds? Right along the edge there. Yep, you. Birds is correct, excellent, thank you. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. All right. So uh, by way of introduction tonight, uh, I just have a little bit of background information about our speaker, Dr. Lang. Um, he did his undergrad at the University of Michigan and uh, visited uh, the Itasca Field Station for a number of summers to do projects up there. So he was uh, making his way westward into Minnesota and eventually North Dakota uh, for education um, and then earned his PhD from the University of Minnesota in 1977. Um, his studies were performed in South Florida, but one of the reasons that he went into studying crocodiles and alligators is because of a tropical biology course he took from Dr. Frank Barnwell, who is also here in the audience tonight. <laughs> um, and uh, so he told me that in the Bell Museum, the one that we're currently packing up and moving, um, there was a time when his project alligators were kept in the toilets. Um, <laughs> in the touch and see room. <laughs> um, in, in swimming pools, actually. Not actually in the toilets like everybody's worst crocodile nightmare. Um, and, uh, and then they were moved into their special tanks that they, they had for the touch and see. Um, he did his postdoc work in Australia for several years and taught with his wife, Gretchen, who's also here tonight, who is an anthropologist um, at the University of North Dakota. And uh, yes, one of, the, one of the very important things that he's worked on over the years that may come up tonight, but is not specifically the topic, um, was the temper, tem, excuse me, temperature determination of the sex of eggs of crocodiles. So, uh, you know, whether they were hatched to be female or male, depending on what temperature they were kept at when they were incubated. Um, and that being determined in some way, biologically, by, by the hatching mother, I guess. Yeah? Is it the... Well, I, oh, okay. Oh, just the temperature? So there's, she didn't make any kind of decision about whether to like warm it or cool it necessarily? Interesting, I didn't know. All right, well, excellent. I just wanna bring Jeff up here to get started with his, uh, his talk. So thank you very much. Please welcome Dr. Lang to Cafe Scientifique. Great, well thanks so much for, for coming out tonight. And uh, I wanna tell you a, a little story about uh, sort of a passion of mine. Uh, whenever, when I, when I meet someone and they sort of say, well, what are you doing? Why are you going to India? And I'm, I, I try to explain that I'm kind of like a bird watcher except I'm actually uh, studying reptiles, which is what I've been doing for, for quite a long time. Uh, not only did we look at uh, sex determination in, in alligators and crocodiles, alligators in, uh, here in, in the U.S. and crocodiles in Australia, but um, we also looked at uh, uh, sex determination in some of the uh, turtle species. So I've ended up uh, spending a lot of time looking at um, long-lived reptiles, some of which are, are quite big. And the story that I'm going to tell tonight uh, really revolves around a, a quite a series of, of sort of accidental encounters. And, and, um, and, and if you'd asked me 10 years ago if I'd 
intended to spend as much time in India as I have, I, I probably would have said there, there's no way this, that, that, that could have happened. But um, I'll, I'll go ahead and start the story, and, 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 uh, and I do invite you to just interrupt uh, as we go along. So um, the uh, gharial is a, is a very unusual crocodile. So one of the main take-home messages that I, that I want to want to convey is um, not all crocodiles uh, sort of uh, lurk around near billabongs and pull people out of, out of tents. So there's some very big reptiles and they do some very, very subtle things. So I hope one of the things that you might uh, go away with tonight is the idea that, that uh, some of these large reptiles uh, are very interesting and probably do provide some sort of a window on, on what many of the other reptiles and reptile relatives um, may have done and, um, and as we're learning, we didn't know a lot of the information um, that I'm going to be talking about tonight. So let's go ahead and get started. So this is another uh, sort of title slide. They're actually almost 300 babies. And in the middle is a five meter male. The male is distinguished, it's the only crocodile species in which you can tell the males and the females apart by an actual distinctive feature, and that is the development of this large gara in the male. And this thing is really big, it's about the size of a pot, and in fact, uh, the, the, the name gara is a Hindi word for pot, the small style of pot. And this is almost the size of a gara of a five meter crocodile. And uh, I'll just take a minute here just so that we know exactly how big a five meter crocodile is. Jeff, would you grab the end of that? Pardon? It's right on the tip of the snout. So. So uh, this is um, one of the ones I'll show you that we put a radio on. Uh, whoops, wait, 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 okay. 15 feet, 16 feet, 17. There we are, right there. So this was the size of one of the animals that I'll be talking about. I'll just leave this out here so that uh, hopefully I won't trip on it. So the gara is is right here, it's on the end of his nose. And actually, it's essentially a series of folds, it's a cartilaginous structure that the air actually goes through and then it exits out the back. And so when he breathes, he actually sort of blows air toward his eyes. And, uh, we don't really know what the function of this, of this uh, gara is, but hopefully I'll give you some clues. So the other uh, take home, I think, is that um, we've had really, really uh, strong support from the zoo community, both in the US as well as the international zoos. One of our, one of our main supporters has been the city council of Prague, because the Prague Zoo is actually uh, owned by the, the people of Prague, and they have supported us to the tune of around uh, ten to $15,000 a year for the last three or four years. And this has been very, very major and important uh, and significant. And it's the zoos that primarily are supporting the kind of work we're doing, which is very qualitative, descriptive, you might call it natural history. But I think it's really key to understanding some of the things we need to know to make good conservation decisions. So this is the animal. It's a very unusual animal. Uh, you, we talked a little bit about alligators and crocodiles, and those are really a good, good series of questions. Uh, Gariel are in a third group, and they're the only species of that group living. But there's a very extensive evolutionary record. For instance, there used to be big gharials in South America, in Central America, even in Florida. And uh, so it's a group that's been around for a long time, 
But today, the only surviving member of the group is this, is this one species. Uh, they have very big eggs. The eggs are almost three times bigger than an average alligator or, or average crocodile egg. Uh, they have very long snouts. They begin eating fish almost within a week to 10 days after hatching. They're, I would call them very precocial. They begin swimming uh, upstream against the current right away within a couple of weeks. They live in groups. <laughs> and the groups of the babies are usually accompanied by adults. So they're only about, they're only about uh, 2,500 gharial globally surviving. They used to be, uh, extend all the way from Western Iran all the way in, uh, through Burma. But today they're really, the main populations are in India and there's one small population in Nepal. So the total number we, we estimate is around 2,500. These are non-hatchlings, but this would be adults and juveniles. And by far, 80% or so of the entire world's population is on the Chambo River. Now the Chambo River is a real sort of no man's land. It's uh, essentially the home of, 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 of bandits, dacoits. It has a very checkered history in, in North India. And there was a film made in the 80s, uh, The Bandit Queen, and I just wanted to show a little uh, segment of that. So this is the terrain. It's this uh, incredibly steep, high banks on one side. Uh, there are people that actually live along the river. They take all their water, their drinking water, all the water for their livestock out of the river. And uh, the river is essentially inaccessible most of the time. There are no easy places to put boats in. There are very few boats. Uh, and people make a living along the river. This is a really interesting film if anyone uh, would like to uh, uh, look it up and watch it. It's a, it's a very interesting story about a, 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 a woman who, who became a, a, a very infamous uh, bandit in, uh, in this area. So the Chambal is sort of known. The one thing about the Chambal is it essentially is an unholy river. It essentially takes its name from uh, uh, thousands of cows that were killed in the river ran blood. And uh, so th that may actually be one of its, uh, one of this, one of its uh, saving graces. Uh, it's also the only really large protected river system, and this is in North India. And there are three main states, Madhya Pradesh, which is where most of the tigers are in India, some 300 or more. Uh, Rajasthan, which uh, extends over into uh, semi-arid and, and desert area, and the state of Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh is the size of Minnesota. We just had, they just had an election. There are 230 million people. The density is about 500 people per square kilometer. So this is the, one of the largest and densest concentrations of, of people in the world, and certainly in India. There are a lot of neat animals. This is uh, one of the hard-shell turtles. It's an herbivore, uh, the red-crowned roof turtle. There are two species of soft-shell turtles that get almost a meter across. They're, they're huge. Uh, they're carnivorous. The mugger crocodile occurs in habitats uh, with the gharial, but tends to not be uh, as numerous. But uh, within five kilometers of the place where we stay, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, a little 10-year-old boy was taken by a mugger. So they still are, are definitely uh, uh, pose problems uh, to the people living on the river. There's a very uh, a unique dolphin, freshwater dolphin, the Gangetic dolphin, almost blind, and a wide variety of, of birds. This is a huge river. It's sort of uh, similar to the Mississippi. But during the monsoon, it floods about 30 feet. Uh, and it has a, a, an expanse almost like the Mississippi. So this enormous basin fills up and essentially gets flushed out every monsoon. 
These are Indian skimmers. They're, they're uh, known only from a few places. And uh, so what brought me to the Chambo was the fact that there were all these, gari there were gharials there, but the gharial, it sort of had a double whammy in the, in the mid to, to late 200, 2000s. Uh, it was uplisted to critically endangered on the basis of the fact that a number, uh, that the numbers of animals had been steadily declining uh, up until about 2004 or five. And then in the winter of 2007 and eight, there was a mass mortality of at least 100, two to four meter gharial. And no one really understood what this was all about. It was uh, in December, January, and February, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. But that actually opened the door, so to speak. Uh, one of the problems with working in in South Asia, and particularly India, is uh, that there's a real strong um, status quo um, mentality. And that is, uh, especially when it comes to working on some of these animals, uh, doing things like uh, catching the animals and attaching tags to them, for instance, because there is a risk associated with that. And uh, any, any risk, uh, usually implies uh, someone has made some mistakes. And so uh, it was uh, easier just to simply not take the risk on the chance that an animal would be killed, especially these animals that are endangered. But when so many animals died, the uh, forest departments in the three states, and they're the ones that have jurisdiction, actually uh, allowed uh, some research to take place. Now, what we wanted to do was find out really what, what, what uh, this mass mortality meant in terms of the, the, the total population. So we wanted to get some idea of how healthy the population was. We wanted to find out more about uh, what the animals were doing, uh, and that would hopefully tell us a little bit more about possibly the causes and consequences of the die-off. And then eventually, the idea was to come up with some kind of recovery plan or a conservation plan for the species. And we tried to focus on um, two key elements. One was just what, what did an individual animal need in order to make a living through its lifetime? So we wanted to know how it used space and, and how that related to the seasons and uh, from year to year. And then the other key element, of course, with these uh, reptiles, especially these long live reptiles like uh, crocodilians and turtles, is related to the, one of the uh, questions uh, at the beginning here, and that is that uh, many, many young are produced, but only a few survive. And uh, so understanding something about the reproductive biology was important. So we use some standard techniques, and I'll show you a little bit about that, but you can see here, uh, we caught animals. Uh, here you can see a radio on the tail mounted on the dorsal surface. We caught animals using uh, nets, and then we uh, tracked them with telemetry. And we were uh, fortunate that uh, I had previously worked with turtles in Minnesota, in Nebraska, um, working with ATS, which is a company that has its origins at the University of Minnesota at Cedar Creek. And uh, uh, we've had a very uh, productive relationship working with uh, that telemetry. It's a world-renowned uh, uh, telemetry company uh, doing uh, for wildlife tracking. So we put radios on animals, partly just to find out how animals were using uh, the river and, and, and how they were moving around. And we used those individual animals, which we kept close track of, as indicators of what the whole population was doing. And we started, uh, we had kind of a rocky start in 2008 because the monsoon started. So we only had one animal uh, tagged. And then we uh, tagged two more, uh, or nine more, in 2009. But we did this during the breeding season, so this was really not the time to do it. So we learned our lesson. And from then forward, uh, we 
caught animals uh, post monsoon in uh, November and December, and we tagged some additional animals. So we could keep track of each animal for about a year to a year and a half to two years. And um, actually, I was surprised when we finally added this up. We initially targeted the two to uh, four meter sized animals. Those are the ones we wanted to keep track of uh, because those are the ones that died during the die off. But uh, as we went on, it became obvious that we needed to learn more about what the, the bigger animals were doing. So I'm going to just give you uh, some, uh, some of our experiences here. This was the uh, 2013. We were able to get a couple of larger animals, including this uh, junior male. And uh, we learned our lesson slowly but surely. It, it's uh, not too easy to handle these animals. And uh, one of the things we learned is we need to stabilize the front of the animal and, uh, and not uh, take such uh, risks when we're releasing animals. So from this point onward, we, uh, we put a stick in next to the snout. And the snout was usually tied, and then we released the snout. And then the problem here was that uh, everyone got off on the count of one instead of three. <laughs> Except uh, Monsami, who was the crack expert from the Madras Crack Bank. He, he stayed on the front, but it was a little, uh, a little dicey. So this animal had uh, two tags, one on the neck and one on the tail. And... Uh, here you'll see, uh, so the problem with Gariel that we found uh, early on was that you can't uh, uh, trap them, which you can do with most other crocodiles. You can put a piece of meat in a trap, you can make a trap out of netting, and you can set it, and eventually a crocodile will go in the trap and get caught. But the problem with Gariels are they're fish eaters, and so you have to actually net them. But the problem with netting them is they're really good at getting avoiding nets. And if they get to be three meters and then four meters and bigger, they get to be experts at crossing nets and, and essentially evading nets. So we had to do some very complicated net sets. And as you can see, uh, we had an experienced team of catchers. and. Uh, they got better and better as time went on. Actually, what you can't see is how happy they are that they got a really big animal. And uh, they knew that it was re reasonable. These are fishermen, so they have to deal with these animals. Uh, and often, uh, the, the, the easy way to deal with a gharial if you're a fisherman is you just take an ax and chop its snout in half, which sounds really horrible and usually is. But uh, these fishermen became very, very good at catching gharial. And this happened to be an animal that we caught and we tracked when it was two meters long and it weighed 35 kilos. And five years later, we caught it and it was four meters and weigh, we think it weighed about 10 times as much. We didn't actually, we weren't able to weigh some of these really big animals in the field. But uh, the... Uh, the guys that are working are pretty good at carrying uh, 50 kilo and 100 kilo grain sacks, so uh, we, we think we had a pretty good estimate. Anyway, the problem with these really big animals is just that they're really huge, and uh, they don't really struggle very much. They, 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 they don't have much stamina. They get very tired, but they're just uh, unbelievably uh, heavy and awkward to move around. Everyone was quite delighted. This is the big male. And I just included this because you can see. So this is its snout. And this is this big lump of cartilage, which essentially is folded multiple times. And we think it acts as sort of a resonator when the animal breathes. Uh, here you can get a better idea of how large the animal was. and. Uh, So I want to focus now on, on some of the reproductive aspects because those, be, those were really some of the most surprising and uh, some of the things that really distinguishes Gariel from some of the other crocodilians. 
Uh, first of all, the animals nest during the dry season. They don't make a mound nest like alligators and some of the crocodiles. They actually dig a hole in the sand, more like uh, some, of the, some of the turtles that you might be familiar with. They nest together in, in colonies, and then the nests all, and they, and they nest at the same time, and then the nests all hatch more or less at the same time. So there's synchronous hatching. And then, unlike any of the other crocodilians, they stay together in a big group. So all the babies, instead of going off with mama in one direction and another direction, which is what most of the other crocodiles do, and alligators, they form a larger and larger group, or crash. And a number of females are usually involved in attending these creches. So here you'll see, this is a female coming up to open her nest. We find the nest by simply going and patting on the sand and within two or three days of hatching, you can hear the young in the nest, they're calling, oh, 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 oh. And, and the volume of the calling is related to how many babies have hatched. So here's a female digging up her nest. And here's some babies here. There's an eye shine, another eye shine, and here's some young that have just come out. And if you noticed, the baby comes out of the egg and then almost instantly gets sort of hurled out of the nest. <laughs> They, they probably uh, can hatch uh, a day, two, three days, uh, but they're uh, 16 to 20 inches down in the sand. And it's very unlikely that they would be able to uh, dig their way to the surface, for instance. It probably requires the female to open the nest. Uh, they, there's, there's enough air. Good question, though. So here, here's, some young, here's some young in a nest, and you can just barely see at the top here, there's some eggshells, but this is actually the shoreline. So there's a whole group of young that have already hatched, and what happens is the young simply walk from the nest down to the water. So this is the, the only, probably the only crocodilian that doesn't do this mouth transport, where they pick up the babies one at a time, or a mouthful of babies, and carry them down to the water like alligators do and most of the other crocodiles. So there's essentially a reception committee at the water. Here are a couple of adults. And all these are eye shines of babies, probably from two or three nests that have already hatched, uh, ready to greet the, uh, the animals that have, um, that have just hatched from a nest. Now here's a, this is a backwater. The main channel of the river is on the other side over near these trees. And there were three nests, and then a fourth nest. This is the one that most recently hatched. And this is where all the young are. So here's the female, and uh, some of the young. You can see they're, they're only a few days old. They have quite a bit of yolk yet. And in this case, I was sitting on the bank, observing and filming, and um, one of the local shepherds came and, and said, uh, Basically, you know, this is when I do my laundry, I take my bath, I say my prayers, um, any problem? And he didn't have any problem with the gharial over here, and the gharial didn't have any problem with, with his doing his thing on this side of the river. And I didn't have any problem with either of them, so. Here's another situation where a female has come over. These are uh, young from two clutches. Whoops. And what happened in this situation is that there were two large river turns that were dive bombing the babies and they scattered the young into the water. And the female was actually out in mid river and came over to where the young were. Whoops. And then she leapt up. about two-thirds out of the water toward the, toward the turns in an effort to try to protect the young. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> Eventually the babies came out basking and the turns left. 
This is a, a woolly neck stork. So some of these large wading birds also are main predators. You can see the way the young have moved away here. And here you can see there's some young from two clutches along the shoreline. This is just a still, and this is a woolly neck stork. And this is what happened. <laughs> so these, these uh, avian uh, predators are really significant, especially during the daytime. And the fact that there are adults attending to the young makes a, makes a difference. The females stay with the young at night. So here's a female emerging. You can see a fish in the water. So we did a lot of game camera work and we're continuing to do that. So these young are just a couple days old and uh, they're at the water's edge. And so you can see, you literally there are hundreds of, of babies. And the interesting thing is that even though there are 10, 15, 20 females sometimes associated at these nesting colonies, only a couple females are the main dominant females that come in to take care of the young. They seem to take turns, but there is definitely some sort of a dominance hierarchy. But they don't stay with, next to the babies all day or all night. They come and go. So this is just a video, a, a, a time lapse, and you can see the time here. So now it's uh, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, and you can see the female comes in, 10 o'clock, midnight. So the female comes and then she goes, and the young sort of spread out. Sometimes they're on her back, four o'clock in the morning. And then it gets light, and you can see see how tight the group is now during the day. So there, there's, there's some, there must be some advantage in, 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 in not being dispersed and dispersing at night. So the, the young all hatch at one, one time. They form these really large groups. Uh, the females are sort of more or less on routine attendance. But if there's a major disturbance, usually the females will retreat back to mid-river, and a, a guardian male associated with the, with the nesting site or the crash will come in and defend the young. And this is one of the rare times that you see the males, because they're very good at sort of avoiding being around. So this is just a male, sort of a close-up view. He happened to, to pose right in front of one of the game cameras. And you can see here's the gara on the tip of his snout. You can see he's got essentially just a narrow bone for his lower jaw, and same thing on the upper jaw and the skull. And then here's the gullet. And uh, here's a, another male that came out, and you can see how close he is. Here's the microphone, here's the lens of my camera, here's a, a sun umbrella. And he came out literally almost into my lap, and we sat there for two hours. And, and then I got up with an iPhone and I was gonna do a panorama. And at that point, he just turned around and, and, and went, went racing back into the water. But, but during that two hours, we were sitting quietly. The, the young came out and they started to crawl on his tail. And he was just simply there. He was just stationary next to the young. Now this is a... Still, you can see this was a place where we had 30 nests that hatched, so this is a large group of young. We actually had two, two groups, a very large group and a smaller group. And if you approach one of these groups, what happens is uh, the females will usually retreat back to mid-river and the male will come from either downstream or upstream. He's not necessarily right there, but he, he responds fairly quickly. So, now this is the video, you can see the young are moving around. And the male has come in and then positions himself literally between us as we approached and, and, and any of the young. And now you can, you can hear what it sounds like when the animals breathe through this gara. 
It's actually much louder than this when you're actually on the river. Uh, take my word for it. But uh, So part of the function of that gara is to sort of make this uh, uh, breathing, accentuate the breathing, and make that uh, very audible uh, for the animals, uh, in the, for anybody in the vicinity. And here's a male at night. With young, you can see young are sort of totally all over his uh, body. And here's a male early in the morning. A much more subtle display and then... And uh, the young uh, vocalize a little bit. Here's some crows fly over and the young go scurrying into the water. And initially, uh, during some of our, uh, the first years when we were making observations, we just sort of sit quietly and this is what would happen. The young would begin to come out, they begin to bask, and the male is simply there in attendance um, without doing a lot of displaying. Just another example of there, there are a number of different uh, gradations in terms of the breathing to be sort of modulated, and then the young respond by vocalizing when the male uh, breathes in this way. Yep. Uh, they have 110 teeth. Yep. Um, the question is, are they friendly? Are they friendly? Um, I don't know if I'd call any crocodiles friendly, but, um, but they definitely um, get used to uh, regular activities on the river that people engage in. They take their goats down, they water their cattle, they do their laundry, they take a bath. Uh, Gariel are fish eaters and they, they just simply don't pose any particular problem to people. The only time that you might have a difficult time and when they might not be friendly is if you were holding one of the babies and the baby was vocalizing. And that's what we're doing here. What's been happening behind me is what we did was we uh, recorded the vocalizations and just played them through a little speaker. We have a little, you know, like one of these, uh, suction shower speakers, you know, that you can, and you can move it around. And uh, so we played the vocalization of a baby that was being held, presumably being threatened, and the male came right in. And you can see from the way it moved around, we had a microphone here because we didn't know if it was going to vocalize or make any sounds but you could see it came in and it just sort of moved around the microphone. We thought it might bite the microphone. It never did anything like that. All it did was just sort of nose around very inquisitively. The males stay around with the young for about four to six weeks, but they're most attentive during that first couple of weeks when the young are really small. And if there's any kind of a, a sort of multiple threats, in this particular case, there were people that came down to the river and there was a pond here and on the other side. So both the male and the female came and, and guarded the crash, essentially, in this case. And there was another uh, instance in which there were some uh, kites that were threatening uh, a clutch of young. And here's the male, this is the male's gara and his eyes and uh, the female with some young on her head. Anyway, both parents came in and, and essentially were both present to, um, to, to uh, confront the, the potential predators. And so the people get used to the uh, animals on the river and so here's one of these large males and here you can see a grandfather has just taken a bath and there's a little three or four year old boy that comes out of the water and there's a woman doing her laundry in the back and in a minute she'll sort of emerge with a sorry 
And all of this sort of just goes on without people being too concerned. People do distinguish between Gariel and, and, and the muggers, which do pose a, a threat. So in addition, so, so the, the very unusual thing about Gariel, again, is that the males are so heavily involved in the parental care or, or the guarding. And uh, this is not really, there are examples in some of the other crocodile species of males uh, behaving in a, in a protective manner, but not, nowhere near to the extent that, that uh, is evident in, these, in, the, in the Gariel. And then we have a couple of instances of what we think is guarding behavior by animals that we don't think are the parents. And I'll give you a couple of the examples. This is that animal that we tagged. And it only had a little tiny gara, and we know it wasn't involved in any breeding. But yet it was the main guardian for two years at one of the creches that had the first year 10 nests and the second year closer to 15 nests. So it was the guarding male, but it was not the breeding male in that area. Their breeding, uh, the, the breeding male set up uh, essentially breeding arenas or territories, and uh, it's very obvious which males are doing most of the breeding. So this male was not, but, but the third year, this male became one of the breeding males and actually had a breeding area near the uh, nesting site, which he also was guarding. Yeah, I, I think what, what I think is happening is that, that we essentially have some apprenticing. And what happens in these situations at the creches is the male and, males and females have to communicate in some way and they have to coordinate the protection of the young and that may afford some of the younger males with opportunities to become familiar with the experienced nesting females and give them a, 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 an advantage in future years when they uh, aspire to be breeders. So I think that's actually what's going on in some cases. And could, you, could you repeat that question on the mic? Uh, are there some males that opt out of this process? Well, we, we, we're not really, at, we're, this, we're still sort of unfortunately in the anecdotal stage. Uh, we, we think there's pretty strong evidence. Let me give you the other example. The other example was, uh, oh, this is just, uh, just to show the development of the gara. So here's uh, this little sort of knob on the, on the junior male that we tagged in 2013, and two years later, it had a fairly well-defined gara, and by this time, it was actually beginning, it was breeding. I think I, I've got a couple more questions okay. up here, if it's not too... Sure. Okay. What are the primary sources of food for these infants? Is it like minnows in the water, or how many fish are there, and how mature are the fish that the okay. little ones eat? Uh, really good question. I think I'm going to answer it for you. Can you give me another five or ten minutes, and uh, then we can follow up? Okay, one last one yep. right behind it, John. Yeah. So what kind of um, tag? Is it like a radio tag, or is it like, um, like a video cam or something? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, a video cam would be fun to put on one of these, I guess. They put them on sea turtles, and you can eat, watch them eat jellyfish and stuff, but eventually we, maybe we'll do that. Right now, we're just putting uh, regular radio tags, and then we're also putting GPS tags, which uh, essentially multiple times each day uh, go up to the satellites and take a fix and a reading, and then we can remotely download Every three or four or five months, we can download all the records between downloading periods, and we can tell where that animal was. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. And eventually, it might be possible to, to, to put some sort of a visualization devices on the animals. So this is the other situation. This was a, this was a place where we had... A, uh, 11 nests in 2010 and 20 nests in 2011 and uh, 
30 nests in 2012. And this male with a very distinctive sort of gar that probably was injured at one point uh, was the main breeder and also the guardian. In 2010 and 11, in 2012, he was the main breeder, but then between breeding and nesting, this male came in. They had a giant, um, a major series of uh, uh, contests, and both animals got scarred. This male disappeared, and this male stayed around, and he's the one that we featured in our, in our uh, uh, image right at the beginning with all the young around. He was essentially the guardian uh, with the maximum number of, of young uh, from 28 nests that hatched, so uh, 1,000 plus babies. But we're pretty sure that he was not the breeder of, of most of the animals in this nesting colony. So this is a case where one animal displaced another one and uh, did the guarding. In this particular case, this animal is quite old and he may be guarding in part so that he can continue to, to maintain his, his dominance as a breeder. We're not really sure. But it's very interesting that the, the rule seems to be uh, a guarding male is associated with uh, any uh, larger group of nests. And in the cases where we have small numbers of nests, we usually end up with much higher levels of predation. Either the nests are disturbed or they're predated or both. Now the thing that really was, was quite strange was last year um, we noted with the game cameras some instances of some three meter animals that looked like they were female in size sneaking in in the crashes and in a couple of cases taking young. So here, this is a guarding female. These are some young. This particular young is actually not a very healthy one. He's one with a lot of yolk. He probably came from an egg that, that um, uh, wasn't developed properly. And you'll see in the video now, this is a still, but here's the video. That particular animal seemed to be singled out. We have only a few instances where, where um, these uh, three meter size animals came in and, and uh, selectively took hatchlings. We're not really sure what's going on. We're guessing, we're guessing that uh, it may have to do with the fact that, these, that, a, that a male that's only three meters is still very much under heavy pressure to grow. And this may, there isn't a lot of food at, 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 during this pre-monsoon period. And so some males may uh, attempt to come in, but usually that sort of predation episode uh, was followed by the dominant big gar, a guarding male coming right in close to wherever that incident happened and making his presence known. Okay, feeding, what do the little ones do? So the, the females stay with the young. And that's the interesting thing about these uh, small gharial is that, you know, they, they, they process the yolk that, that they hatch with. So they hatch with a belly full of yolk, but that gets processed within a, a week to 10 days. And they begin feeding almost immediately. And they take pretty much anything they can get in their mouth. So basically they're taking all different kinds of fish uh, as long as they're uh, uh, small enough for them to, to swallow. And so if you're looking at one of these creches uh, when the animals are two, three, four weeks old now, so here's what they're feeding on. They're big fish driving small schools, schools of minnow right into the shallows and sitting along the shoreline are all of these fish traps. Every one of those little gharial is sitting there with its tail up against the back of the sand in the shallow water and it's got its mouth slightly agape. And so the, fi the fish are literally just being driven right into the, to the mouths of the, of the uh, waiting young. But then the monsoon comes. So in early July, all of a sudden, the monsoon comes with a vengeance. 
Water levels rise, they begin rising uh, by meters. And what, when that happens, the adults essentially just head downstream. So they, they leave the, the young. And it's a, around that time when, when the crash, when, when the integrity of the crash in terms of, its, uh, of the animals staying together seems to uh, wane and the animals seem to go off on their own. What we think is happening in these situations when the water comes up very quickly is you have a lot of very shallow habitat created. And so what we think is happening is the smaller animals are actually moving laterally and we have good evidence, though, that the bigger animals are moving downstream. And so the adults go down, and it turns out one of the places that acts like a magnet is the confluence of the big rivers. So this is the Chamble coming along here. This is a female near her nesting site, and then she moves down, and she moves down uh, within a matter of just a few days. For instance, uh, one of these animals was observed in the evening at a bridge 30 kilometers from the confluence, and the next morning she was down at the confluence. This is the Yamuna, which goes through Delhi, and by the Taj and Agra, and on down. It's only about the tenth the size of the Chambal, but where those two rivers come together, there's a very good feeding opportunity. So during the monsoon, there's rapid movement downstream, and primarily by the large adults, and then they hang out at the confluence while the rivers are in flood. And this is what it looks like. Uh, these rivers, uh, they have slightly different drainages, so the Yamuna actually floods a little bit ahead of the Chambal, so they're not uh, perfectly uh, coincident in terms of, of their flooding regimes. So in this case, this is the Chambal in the distance. You can see how muddy it is, and you can see there's almost a boundary layer, right, or a boundary right here between the two rivers. So this is the Yamuna, slightly clearer and less in flood at this particular time. And what the animals do are doing is essentially just moving right along this boundary layer, and they're feeding. And the fishermen know this is like really good place to fish because the turbulence that's created where the two rivers are coming together disorients the fish and makes them a little easier to catch. And so it's possible to just, actually for the adults, this is like the, the, the uh, adult equivalent of what we saw with the hatchlings. The, the, the adults simply congregate near the confluence and they just are almost constantly feeding. And this is the warmest time of year. The water is high. And so probably almost easily two-thirds to 75% of their energy is probably uh, acquired during this only two- or three-month period. This is a, a aggregation. There's very little fighting. Uh, there's very little uh, interaction at all other than the fact that animals are just feeding. So the large adults move. We were fortunate that we had three uh, near adult female sized animals in the first group of 10 that we marked. And we, um, or the, uh, the, sorry, the second group. And, and we monitored um, uh, some longer movements of roughly 100 kilometers. And then when we put the GPS tags on, we were able to get uh, longer movements. So our big mover now is a female that's moved uh, 210 kilometers up and down the river, and she's done this in 2015, uh, 16, and now in 17. So she just, this is a seasonal pattern. She just basically moves upriver, and this is where she hangs out, where eventually she breeds and nests, and then when the monsoon comes, she uh, heads downstream, and then uh, turns around and does the whole thing all over again the next year. This is the big male. And the male has a slightly different pattern. And just bear with me here. This is, uh, these are the locations. And what you'll see right away is this is sort of the dry season range. Here's the river, the Yamuna. Here's the Chambal. 
And that big explosion was essentially just lots and lots of locations in the same, or uh, locations on different days in the same place. So basically the animal had a very restricted range during the dry season, then it moved down and it hung out down here during the uh, monsoon, and then it, it, it actually went down a little bit in the, um, in the combined Yamuna and Chambal, and then it turned around and it went right back up again. So the males also have uh, well-defined patterns, but they tend to sort of uh, head back to their familiar areas um, uh, without uh, such long distances in most cases. Okay, this is just to give some idea of, of what it's like moving around during the dry season, tracking some of these animals. This is, um, we, we essentially go by Jeep down to the river through some market towns. This is uh, one of the local towns where we stop and get uh, our vegetables. There are always surprises in India. The last time when I was there in November, I, the, literally as I was flying in to do the catching tagging, uh, they announced the demonetization and all of a sudden overnight, all the currency uh, was not valid anymore and uh, none of the ATMs worked and, and we had some exciting times trying to, trying to uh, catch our animals. So we ended up, this is one of the little riverside villages right on the river. And uh, this was one of the trips when uh, Gretchen went along. And so she, uh, most of the, um, in the rural areas, the, the, the women are very uh, cautious about uh, any uh, contact with anyone from outside and uh, tend to keep themselves veiled. And uh, so here in a minute, you'll just see there's the river and uh, one of the camels resting, and, and uh, there are several generations of women that uh, Gretchen was talking to while we were chasing. So life on the river is is um, is, is definitely challenging. Um, mustard is the main crop that's grown because it can uh, be grown in, under these semi-arid conditions. Millet, and of course the river is used for pretty much everything. Um, everything from drinking to bathing to watering the livestock to actually a, a dumping ground for. Um, for stuff you don't want. Okay, well what about the smaller animals? One of the things we found early on was that these smaller animals that were two to three meters showed almost no extensive movements at all. They had really restricted ranges, uh, home ranges. Uh, they just didn't move very far up and down the river. They didn't go down to the confluence during the monsoon. They didn't really move upriver. And we think uh, this helps us understand a little bit about the, the die-off that happened. Uh, some vets came in, they did some uh, autopsies, but it was never really possible to find out what killed the animals. The conventional explanation was that it was pollution from the Yamuna, but the problem is that the Yamuna is chronically polluted. It's, it wasn't just polluted during this 2007 and 8 period, it's, it's pretty much polluted most of the time. And this is the pattern of the die-offs. The die-offs all occurred about 50 or 60 kilometers upstream from the confluence. And these animals, if they behave like the animals that we tagged, were not actually moving down to the confluence. So they probably weren't necessarily becoming exposed directly to the, to the toxins. So what we think was happening was some sort of local spill the subadults are definitely sedentary. And the thing about the die-off was it was very specific to Gariel. It didn't affect anything else. Not, no, not, none of the turtles, none of the uh, other uh, aquatic birds that ate fish. 
Um, uh, it didn't affect the mugger. Um, it happened very quickly, within about four or five weeks, and it was very restricted in terms of uh, its uh, geographic uh, location. So whatever it was um, may have been some sort of local toxin spill. We just simply don't know. Okay, uh, so this is one of the other things that we've been uh, able to do is to sort of work out within the year what the animals are doing at different times. And you can also appreciate if you're gonna do a survey, one of the best times to do it is in February when the animals are out basking, so it's easy to count the animals. But if some of the animals that you're counting have moved up the river, and others have actually been living on the river in the same place, then it's important to know a little bit more about what, the, what individual animals are doing and what the different life stages are doing uh, in order to uh, interpret uh, what you go out and, and, and see. So um, I just wanted to show you a little bit about what the animals are doing the rest of the year. So these are some males. Uh, and the only reason to show this is just simply, you can see the development of this gara. Here's an animal with a little tiny nubbin. Uh, here's an animal with a slightly larger uh, knob, uh, about half developed, similar to the one we saw in the animal we tagged. And then here's an animal with almost a full, full gara. So the gara seems to develop on animals as they get larger. Uh, and there's quite a bit of variation in um, the size and how it relates to the animals. But you do see these big gara males uh, happily uh, side by side without any evidence of, of fighting at this particular time. But then the animals begin to display. The males then do display and uh, dominant male begins to establish his dominance for breeding. And um, these are some sequences that we just shot uh, this last February, and we had a couple of instances where we had several males that were nearly the same size uh, contesting for uh, dominance in, in this particular area. And you can see they're not really dueling with their snouts. What they're trying to do is lift their head up high enough, but there is actually uh, a little bit of uh, uh, biting going on because you can see the gars are actually getting quite scarred. This animal has actually lost a lot of the skin on his snout, and his gar is also punctured with tooth marks. But what they're actually doing is trying to essentially uh, lift their head high enough so that they can get on the back of the other animal, and then they ride each other, and presumably that's an indication of how big you are, and then the biggest one eventually uh, ends up uh, being the... Um, dominant animal in that area. Uh, and they, this can go on for two or three hours. This is, these are two animals the year before uh, just taking a break in between one of these contests. And uh, I have a student now who's just begun to do some work. One of the things um, that the Gari will do is make a a sound that we were calling a jaw clap, but it's actually a, 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 a probably more accurately called a popping sound. Yeah, I'm not sure this is going to play. No. Well, anyway, well, I'll just briefly describe what what we found, and that we're just in the initial stages. But uh, what happens here is. Uh, the animal actually um, submerges underwater and produces a popping sound, but it's actually not moving its jaws because there'd be a lot of water disturbance associated with that. And ahead of that is actually an infrasound component because in this particular case, we had uh, two or three spoonbills that were standing in the water nearby, and all of a sudden the spoonbills from a resting with their beak in their back posture woke up and suddenly come to attention, and then a, a fraction of a second later, you can actually hear the sound produced. So there's an infrasound component. The sound is produced underwater, 
but it's not produced by snapping the jaws. It's produced probably by somehow pushing air through different chambers in the respiratory system. It's just been discovered recently that crocodilians actually breathe like birds. They have a one-way airflow system, which is typical of birds and was always thought to be associated with very high energy and maximum oxygen extraction. But in crocodilians, it's probably actually related to something like diving and being able to spend hours underwater uh, in a situation where you're not necessarily using huge amounts of oxygen like birds. Anyway, these are some shots of the male displaying. So the male displays in his uh, breeding area. He usually excludes other males which are on the periphery. And he, um, he this, uh, the, the displays are characterized by this uh, heavy breathing, again, through the, through the gara. And females that are receptive approach the male and then, uh, then they court and mate. The subdominant males, the marginal males, usually approach the females, and the females really don't want to have anything to do with them. And so um, the uh, breeding all happens probably in these breeding arenas that dominant males set up. But we think the pattern is actually quite complicated, and it may actually be the females that are deciding who to breed with, and they're probably actually maybe visiting more than one of these breeding areas uh, in a season. Uh, there's a lot of evidence in most of the other crocodilians of multiple paternity uh, within a clutch. So that means all the clutches aren't necessarily full siblings. And that may well be hap happening in Gariel as well. So most of the action happens underwater. But there you can see the male. In, they're in probably water that's a meter, meter and a half deep. And this takes 10, 15 minutes. So this is a pattern of uh, movement by one of the females. One of the females we had uh, marked with the GPS unit. And what we found was the first year, 2015, uh, the female did, didn't nest, but she hung out near the nesting areas. And then the second year, she actually had a breeding area, which you can see here. And then eventually, she moved from the breeding area down to a nesting area where she eventually laid, laid her nest. So um, the GPS loggers give us much finer scale uh, daily movement of the animals, and that in combination with the uh, with the manual tracking that we're doing. It's sort of a, a way we can ground truth the manual tracking. And in most cases, there's a pretty good agreement between the um, spatial patterns that we get from those two systems. Okay. So then uh, nesting begins. The females dig these nests. Uh, these are trial nests. And you notice they're not up on the top of the high sand. So they love high sand banks. So this is 15 to 20 feet from the water line. And this will, the water line will continue to recede. And then there's deep water usually at the base of these uh, nesting sites. So one of the advantages of putting your nest two thirds of the way up is it's really hard for the predators to get down and uh, steal the eggs. And as a as a guardian or a protector, you can also keep track of what's going on during the incubation period. And the nest uh, is very, the nesting sites are very dynamic along the river. Uh, so they occur, they, typically they're big monsoons and uh, then there are um, nesting areas for a number of years and then they, the, the whole system shifts locally. So. 
And one of the things we're uh, beginning to do in addition to this study of um, communication among the male gharials. So this popping sound that I mentioned, actually the males produce that and they sort of talk to each other essentially over about uh, half a kilometer from one uh, end of the sandbank to the other. And if one animal uh, produces these sounds, the other animal will respond. And, and what we don't know, though, is, is how the adults are communicating with each other, the males with the females, and also with the young. So one of the things we want to do is uh, look in more detail of that at the creches. And also, with the eggshell material, we can essentially identify um, the hatchlings as individuals, and we can also um, uh, get a, uh, a marker for the, for the female. And then we simply have to uh, sample some of the males to work out how genetically, how the animals are related to one another to uh, pin down some of, the, some of the unknowns associated with things like the alloparental care. And then intriguingly, we find that when the animals are like nine months, so this animal is um, uh, about nine months old, and um, the next nesting season is beginning, and some of these animals, there are not many of them because there is a very high mortality rate, but these smaller animals like to hang out near some of the big adults and the big adults actually will display to them, and um, uh, which is very intriguing. And uh, so there's some hint that there's some uh, interaction between these animals uh, even a year after they're, they're hatched. So um, one of the things that we've been trying to do is, is, uh, is keep track of what some of the major threats are. Right now, the main threat to Gurriel, uh on this river system is sand mining. So uh, in, in India now, there's a major development boom. There's a lot of building. And they're literally just taking sand out of these rivers uh, for uh, making uh, mortar. This, this particular kind of sand uh, is probably close to the sort of mechanically ground sand associated with the uh, the less hills, for instance, in western Iowa, where you have these vertical cliffs, but it's essentially sand and clay. That's sort of this, a similar kind of material. So this chamble sand is highly valued because it's really good for making mortar because it keeps the bricks together, apparently. So there's a lot of uh, pressure uh, uh, for sand mining. Um, and then there are continual threats, as you can imagine. This is essentially a clean river. Nobody really can believe that. If, if you've gone to uh, Bombay or Delhi or any of the major cities in India, uh, you know, you really, you really don't think about uh, uh, consuming anything uh, uh, from, from any of the waterways uh, that are visible. But the people that are living along these rivers, and there are literally hundreds of thousands of them, are uh, taking their water. The guys that are working with me doing the tracking are drinking Jumbo water. Uh, there's sort of a, a certain uh, kind of a uh, tough guy um, attitude associated with it. So you know, you, you, if you if you want to threaten someone, you, you uh, threaten someone. You can kind of say, well, don't mess around with me because I drink the chamble. But um, it, it is uh, potable water, and 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 uh, the livestock are totally dependent on it, and as well as for irrigation. So there's there's a major threat in terms of um, water extraction, water coming out of the river. The dams are always a problem, but um, so far there haven't been any dams built on the Chambal other than in the uh, very far, uh, very uh, upper stretches. So these are just some shots of what it looks like. This is the ravine country. You're never very far from people, but you know, in some ways, uh, for studying uh, an animal as secretive and as hard to study as a crocodilian, in some ways, that's a, a that's sort of a asset because the animals are really used to people, and as long as you don't do anything really 
uh, different. So for instance, when we go down and turn on our telemetry equipment and sort of start speaking loudly in English, then, then uh, sometimes we, we think the animals actually can, can tell a difference between when, when there's a different presence on the river. They're, they're incredibly used to sort of the usual day-to-day uh, uh, -day activities. And when there are large groups that move up and down the river, uh, the animals react very differently. So these are just some more shots. Uh, sand mining by camel uh, has been occurring for probably a long time. You can see actually, see here, this is the other side of the river and this is an area where the sand has been removed. Uh, we're also involved in some community programs. This is one of the locals from across the river and uh, these are a whole bunch of babies. And he came over and you know, basically said, why did you let all these animals go in our river? We don't want these gharial in our river. You know, we, we're out fishing, we're catching fish. We don't want these gharial, they're gonna eat all our fish. And uh, yet this was in his backyard. And uh, so there are a number of programs. The forest department sometimes takes the lead. This is one of the forest department guys uh, who is also, um, uh, uh, d leading these uh, community programs uh, that are sort of environmentally uh, focused. This is a little uh, group of uh, villagers. And one of the things is the kids do these plays where different kids uh, take different roles. So this is a turtle and this is a gharial and here's a shepherd and there's a bird and the bird is saying, don't cut down all the trees, uh, you know, leave some place for me to nest. And the turtle saying, don't leave too many nets in the water. And the gharial saying, don't take all the sand, etc." So we, uh, we do uh, capacity building programs for the forest department. And this is the fellow who's done most of the hard work, uh, Pankaj. And the work we've been doing is through the uh, Madras Crocodile Bank. So Ron Whitaker has been a colleague and friend for 30 plus years. We worked in South India earlier at the Crocodile Bank. Uh, this is the small team of uh, trackers. We've got a couple of trackers, a guy that does most of our driving and helps us with the base organization. Pankaj was the one who really observed uh, the male involvement early on and pointed us, uh, pointed this out and uh, was instrumental and has been the main tracker and naturalist uh, researcher on the project year in and year out. Here he is, his father grew up on the river and was a boatman. And this is, uh, this is our cook tracker and the guy who does the community programs for us, one of the local forest guards. And um, this is one of the older uh, headmen in the village where we stay. We stay uh, in a rented building, uh, just sort of in the middle of town. Uh, it's a little village of maybe 1,600 people. This is the building and we have a, a shade area on the roof and that's where we pitch our tents and hang out some of the time. It's pretty basic. Um, Mostly vegetarian, but um, the occasional fish and chicken have been consumed as well. Here's some egg curry. And this is 10 minutes from, the, from our base. So uh, we were actually able to make lots of observations early on. Uh, those are uh, gharial on the opposite side of the river and this was a nesting area for a number of years. Okay, I better stop there, I'm way over time. Thanks very much. Thank you. I, I, we do have some time for some questions. So raise your hand if you've got something you want to ask. I'm going to head up this way first, okay? <laughs> All right, I'm going to start back here. How long do Gariel normally live? Uh, we, well, we don't know. We think probably um, they have a lifespan that probably approximates that, that of uh, people. So... Um, Probably 
uh, these big gara males are probably not really breeding until they're 15 or 20 at the earliest. And uh, the females probably mature maybe by 15 years, but then they, they may well reproduce for 15, 20, or even 25 years beyond that. So um, they're long-lived. And when you think about the, the actual population dynamics, the two animals really just have to replace themselves. So, so this huge production of, of young is, is just sort of, um, it's just sort of a gamble every year. And some years are good years and some years aren't. That's one of the major differences between these long live reptiles and things like birds and mammals, which, you know, produce fewer young, but, but consistently do it in, in, a, in a regular pattern. Uh, they're probably really good years for uh, Gariel, and they're probably not such good years. This species does have uh, their egg temperature determines their sex. But one of the really tricky things about Gariel is that they're incredibly difficult to sex. So, uh, and in, in, in sometimes I, I actually wonder whether they, whether the sex might, might be more labile than it is in some of the other crocodilian species. I mean, uh, weird things happen and, uh, and it's, it's possible. But they're very difficult to sex when they're small, whereas most of the other alligators and crocodiles you can sex as hatchlings. Great. Uh, let's see. I'm going to kind of work my way down, okay? okay? So right over here. What's their dominant sense, and how do they perceive the world? Well, a uh, good question. Um, their, their, you know, their lifestyle is... They're essentially a water's edge predator. They have an incredible visual acuity. So they can see really well, we think. They can see color. Uh, one of the weird things, or one of the things you probably noticed is a strange posture. They all have their, head, their snouts up at this sort of almost like 45 degree angle. Uh, no one's actually done the, a detailed study, but what I suspect is happening is if you have a really long snout like that, if, you're, if you keep your snout horizontal, you, you really can't see beyond your snout. If you're trying to look at the waters uh, on the horizon. So I think by simply lifting the head that they end up having some addition, some stereo vision or some, some, some visual acuity. So vision's important. In, on the pit of every scale, especially around the head, they have a, what, what are called um, integumentary sensory organs. It's sort of like a, 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 do, a do, it all, do, it, do everything in a little sensory organ. It, it, it can, um, it's mechanical. It has, I think, some electrical uh, properties. And um, these things are concentrated in the areas where the, like in the head, where the animal is actually moving its head in, in order to catch fish. Um, uh, hearing is, 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 is fairly good. We think probably that they're, um, they're communicating in this infrasound region, which is, you know, uh, Two to 20 hertz, or very, very low frequency. The sort of, you know, this is the sort of thing you see uh, when you, when, when they show pictures of alligators bellowing, or if you've been down in Florida and you stood on a walkway in a place where alligators are bellowing, it's, you can feel the vibrations. And so that's actually what those spoon bills were sensing apparently before the actual sound that we could actually hear. So, um, so they have a they have multi, you know a, a number of uh, sensory systems that are particularly adapted, and then the, the main thing is that, like for instance, with the respiration, is that that they can remain stationary, you know, for unbelievably long periods of time, and energetically they're very very efficient because you know they like these big animals probably really only have to eat a few months of the year if that and then they can probably even coast through a, a couple of years if, if, if there was some catastrophe. So, Excellent, I'm just working my way down the road okay. here, so a question right here, and then I will, you guys can keep your hands down because I'll get you next, okay? 
I have two questions. One, how long can a crocodile live without water? And the other is those males that died so quickly, the three kilometer males, do you think it was a toxin? Would they have had the small babies around them? Were there a lot of small ones that died at the same time? No, the, 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 okay, let me answer the last question. I mean, the last part of your question. The, the really strange thing is that only the animals in this two to four meter size uh, category were the ones that died during the die off. There weren't any small animals that, were, that, were, that died and there weren't any really big animals, and very few adults, actually. There were mostly sub-adults. Uh, and they're eating different kinds of things, and, and what we really don't know, what we think might have happened is some sublethal effect of some toxin maybe incapacitated some fish. There wasn't a big fish kill off. There have been in other times. In several other species of crocodiles, uh, there's a, there are algal blooms that have been associated with die-offs. They're toxins that are produced by blue-green algae, I think, and, and there have been die-offs uh, related to that. That doesn't seem to be the case in, in the gharial. And what was the first part of your question? Okay, well, um, well gharial, gharial are almost the most one of the most aquatic species. It's the one crack a crocodilian, a living crocodilian, that can't get up and walk on its, on its limbs. It, it doesn't do this sort of a, you know, you've probably, everyone's probably seen this video of this alligator walking across a path down in Florida, right? <laughs> so it looks like, more like a dinosaur because it lifts itself, so its belly's completely off the ground, like by a foot or 18 inches. Gharial are sort of sliding like seals, you know? They, they basically really can't get up and, and uh, and move around on, uh, on, with their limbs. But they have incredibly strong neck muscles that, um, that sort of make up in part for the fact that they're not able to get up and move around. So they're very aquatic. Um, some species of crocodiles, like the Australian freshwater crocodile and the mugger, the one that actually lives in uh, many of the freshwater habitats, the mugger's kind of like an Asiatic alligator in a way. It's about the same size, they're probably a lot meaner, but they actually can, can kind of check out and almost estivate. So they can probably, they make, in Sri Lanka, they make tunnels and during the hot time of year, they actually go down and, and stay underground in tunnels for a period of time. When they don't feed, maybe there's a little bit of water. Most crocodilians will dry out pretty fast if they don't have any access to water that the big problem they have during part of the year is the heat. And so in tropical species, you find they do a lot of heat avoidance. You, there, there's always a, a focus on the fact that alligators are out basking in the sun, so the idea is that animals are always wanting to get warm, but there's a cost to getting warm. When you get warm, your metabolism goes up exponentially, so it really costs you a lot in terms of energy at the high end if you're, if you're hot. So one of the ways you can conserve energy is to stay cool. So one of the things that these animals do during the hot time of year is submerge. And so the gharial actually during May and June, when it, and it's like 50, 45, 50 degrees centigrade. So it's 120 to 130 degrees during this time when the babies are hatching. So we only get up early in the morning and we're out at, you know, five and we're back by eight or nine o'clock and everybody's checked out from noon to four o'clock. It's just too hot. You can't do anything. And we're drinking like seven, eight, nine liters of water a day just to stay hydrated. So, so the gharial probably are not living without water for very long, but some crocodilians can manage for a little while. Okay, we've got another two questions over here. I'm going to hand the mic to you. <laughs> what was your question? Yeah. Why do they have these, those thingies on them? They're um, snouts. What, this? This? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a really good question. I, I'm, I don't know. Hopefully we can find out. We, so what we think is we don't know how the sound is produced. 
So what we need to do is, is get together with uh, somebody who's a respiratory expert like this. Uh, there's a woman in Utah who's actually really studied in detail the airflow. So what happens in crocodilians is they have a whole bunch of chambers, kind of like in birds, and the air comes in, it goes into the back, it's in these chambers, and then it gets pushed through across the, uh, the oxygen exchange system and then out. It doesn't you know, come in and then go out again like in birds and mammals, this sort of typical uh, uh, bird or mammalian lung structure. It's a very unique structure, and uh, so what we think is that maybe this, this gara has to do with per helping produce this sound. This, it, it's not very impressive, I guess, it, and, and we had trouble with the sound because it's kind of a buzzing sound, but uh, I, I guess if you're a gario, you can hear it, and it's important. <laughs> <laughs> I have two questions. Number one, do you know how fast their heartbeat can um, beat? Uh, no, I don't know offhand. Good question. Uh, um, it probably varies a lot with temperature. And um, is there a way to tell the sex of um, right after they're um, like when they're like little? Is there a way? No, no, um, you can't. Okay, one last. Do the babies have the um, gharials? No, only the only the 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 big males. But why? <laughs> well, we don't know. <laughs> okay, we got a question right there. <laughs> I, I was just curious, how big are the eggs? Uh, they're about like that. They're about a hundred. There, so uh, like an alligator egg might be seventy or eighty grams. So uh, and and but a, a gharial egg is going to be about two or three times that, like a huge goose egg probably. And they lay about thirty-five to forty-five, sometimes fifty eggs. And then see they nest all kind of close together, so not right on top of each other, but but within uh, basically a body length or two. And so there's this huge advantage. So what we think is happening is this colonial nesting is sort of the key to the whole thing. The females are basically, you know, calling all the shots. They're basically deciding where the best place to nest is, who they're going to mate with, and then where they're going to nest. So we think that these nesting sites are probably made up of, 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 of offspring that have been parented by males from a number of these different, of different uh, breeding places. And, uh, and so somehow uh, these junior males are getting, uh, getting sort of uh, recruited to, to help guard the babies, in part because maybe they're going to benefit eventually from, um, from breeding opportunities with some of those nesting females. Great. I think we, we'll have to wrap it up there and uh, give just a little bit of time before possibly the next rehearsal order comes in at 9 o'clock. So... Thank you all very, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lang, for being here. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, I really hope to see you for our May uh, installment before the summer comes around. Um, check us out on the website if you have any questions. Thank you again. Bye-bye.